Welcome back to Our Unboxed. This is Tim. Yeah, apparently I never say it in the videos, but Steve's just told you all who I am. So welcome back to the part two of our, what is it now, February Q&A? Yeah, that, that sounds, sounds right. right. Yeah. yeah, I think we've just yeah. squeezed in here at the end with, with the Q&A series. So make sure you go back and watch part one before part two. Lots of good questions in there, lots of good questions to come up. So yeah, let's get into it. Okay, an interesting question here that was heavily upvoted, I believe. I had a look at the comments thread, and I think this one was near the top. Do you recall? Yeah, I think so. I think this was very, very heavily upvoted. Uh, anyway, the question goes, is it weird that those reviews that have tested the uh, Radeon 7 with the 2700X have better results than the majority whom tested with the 900K? Uh, I haven't seen that, so I'm going to take your word for it. I obviously tested with the 9900K, uh, but that's interesting i'm actually really intrigued to look into that like i said i, kn I know nothing of it we found in the past that radeon uh, sorry ryzen cpus uh, perform better with radeon gpus than they do with geforce gpus but uh amd gpus performing better on amd cpus as opposed to intel cpus is a new one for me i haven't come across that before so potentially weird Mm. I'll have to look into that and, and get back to you guys and see if... Uh, I'd love if, if you could point out if anyone's actually done testing to... Actually, it's just occurring to me now that I may have the answer for this question. It could just be that the 2700X is bottlenecking... Yeah, I was going to suggest that. ...the GPUs. In. Yeah. I didn't really want to say that the 2700X would bottleneck these cards because it's very unlikely that it would. But if As you're trying to compare it to a 2080 Ti 1080p, it likely will, though. No, uh, the Radeon 7 would be compared to the RTX 2080. Yeah. And there's no way you're testing those cards at 720p. I imagine the reviews would be looking at 1440p to maybe Yeah, well, there shouldn't be any difference there. That's right. Yeah. So that's a bit strange. Uh, I'd have to see the settings they're using and the games they're testing with. It doesn't really make sense to me at all. And the only uh, scenario where I could see that would be the case is that the 2700X is bottlenecking the RTX 2080. But if... It's very very strange because they deliver the same performance anyway. Yeah. I don't know. I'll look into it. All right, Steve. Yeah. Uh, what has been your favorite game to benchmark? <laughs> favorite game to benchmark? Uh, that's a weird one. It's kind of strange when you've played the same game in the same spot for 60 seconds thousands of times over. I don't think it really matters too much. They're all kind of similar in that regard. You just do your pass and that's it. So my favorite game, I don't know if I've, I couldn't really say a favorite one because like I said, they're all pretty much the same, except my favorites would be the games that don't have a million splash screens, don't take forever and a day to load. So I can just click the icon, the game loads up in a reasonable amount of time. I can get to where I need to test. It has save points. That helps. That yeah. helps a lot. It has it has save, multiple save game points. You can make multiple files and run your testing that way because games where there's like a checkpoint every bloody 20 seconds is a nightmare. Um, and then like Rainbow Six Siege takes forever to open. Absolutely, it takes so long to load on any CPU. It's like an internet thing or something, I don't know. But yeah, games that load quick. <laughs> Question for Steve. I guess I'll take care of that. Uh, thoughts on AMD getting sued for their definition of a CPU core in regards to their FX processors? It's all a bit silly, isn't it, really? Um, I don't really know what to say on that one too much. Did you touch on that in News Corner? Uh, maybe a while back. Yeah, look, it's, it's, I mean, it's... <sighs> it's really hard to even get into. It's kind of like the whole, what we were talking about with the RTX stuff. Like, my opinion, if I'm evaluating RTX now on its own, is very different to how critical I would have been having evaluated on the promise of a month-long pre-order that this is going to be amazing, if, if, if you get what I mean. So it's like, if you saw, like, was there even a pre-order period for FX processors? So there was, you could easily research them and see how they performed in your workload. And who cares how many cores it has? You really just, like, if I told you the nice no k had 30 cores, but then you checked the performance of it and you're like, well, it performs like, what I'd expect out of an eight core processor, then I know it's all just a bit silly, all a bit silly. I think, um, yeah, probably don't need to bash the FX processors this Q and A, but let's try and break that yeah. that trend. All right, fair enough. I think there's another question here for me. 
Um, could you explain the differences between greater gray response times and input latency? And is greater gray response time any way related to refresh rate? So the input latency is how long it takes from the signal from your GPU mm -hmm. to go, well, it doesn't really count the cable, but once it hits the start of the monitor, so once it comes out of the cable into the monitor, and then when it starts to transition onto your screen, that is the input latency. So how long it takes for it to take the input and then start delivering you the image. That's input latency. The greater gray response time is how quickly the pixels themselves can do the change. Mm -hmm. So after the input has been processed and it's ready to be displayed, how long can the crystals physically change in the display? So that's why you normally see a curve like this because it's a, you know, mm -hmm. that's just basically how it works. So yeah, the greater gray response time is how long it takes for the pixels to change. The input latency is how long it takes to process. And yes, greater gray response time, someone's at the door, maybe delivering me a parcel. Um, yes, greater gray response times are related to the refresh rate. They tend to be slower at lower refresh rates. All right, another question. Do oh, you think... It's a monitor question. Hang on a minute, guys. How do you recline these seats again? Tim and his monitors. Oh, let me know how you go, Tim. Wake me up when you're done. I'm sure you could input on this one. Do you think that 21.9 will ever officially replace 16.9 the same way 16.9 overtook 4.3? Movies have been using 21.9 for a long time, no. More games are officially supporting it. More and more ultra-wides, yeah. So is the domination of 21.9 inevitable? Um, what was the question? <laughs> Sorry. Very professional. <laughs> um... Maybe. I don't think it's right for everyone because it is quite wide. So I guess it just depends on the use case. I think 16.9 overtook 4.3 simply because it made a lot more sense for some types of content. Whereas I don't think 21.9 is a clear cut makes more sense over 16.9 as the helicopters military come helicopters back. come over we, my house we've, again. We've been battling with this Q&A. Yeah. There's an, the uh, Melbourne Air Show is on the on the weekend, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. So We've got military helicopters. Yeah, they're delivering the military helicopters yep. to the air show right yep. over my house. They get very, very loud. Yeah, so it's pretty yeah. annoying. So, so um, we'll, um, we'll come back to this question in a moment. Do, 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 do. Helicopters overhead. Get in the chopper! All right, back to normal business. <laughs> the helicopter's been delivered to the airfield. Um, 21.9 over 16.9, yeah. Um, yeah, I just think that it's not going to be suitable for everyone's use case. I think um, so. I'm still advocating for 16.10 to come back. Yeah, 16.10 was I good. I loved 16.10. Um, so, yeah, I just think it depends on the amount of space you have, what you're looking for, whereas, yeah, 4.3 seem to die pretty quick once people realize that wider in that mm. regard is better but yeah so i don't think it'll become as widespread but it'll still be an option for a long time all right question from sal kagan one of our longtime discord members uh what are your thoughts on rendering features like dynamic resolution scaling and temporal reconstruction tech like checkerboard rendering that the consoles make use of and do you think both should become industry standard options across most if not all games on pc as well well, I don't see any reason not to include features like this. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, it doesn't do anything wrong. You can choose to enable it or disable it. So, yeah, there's definitely no reason not to experiment with things like this. I think for PCs, those features need to be better than they are for consoles, simply because with a PC, you're viewing your monitor close. You're more likely to notice artifacts. Mm -hmm. the console gaming, you're mostly on a couch. You'll sit back from your TV. It's harder to spot some of the issues with those technologies. I think they're coming a long way, though, and they certainly could make their way to PCs uh, reasonably soon without much of a quality loss. So I think it's something that should be explored and yeah, there's no real no real negative to including them. Okay, question here. Why do you think AMD screwed up the Radeon 7 launch? Um, did I say they screwed it up? It wasn't a particularly exciting or great launch. I don't think they screwed it up. Or maybe they did with availability, which is the next part. So the card is not available. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of problems at launch. It's too expensive at the moment, like eight hundred plus dollars where I live. Power consumption and noise are to handle manually. I think he means you have to sort of manually adjust those things to get them under control. So manual fan curve, undervolt if you can, uh, and don't forget the no UEFI support. Why is AMD unable to properly launch something like this? <laughs> A lot of these issues seem so obvious to fix. Uh, to you and I, do you have any hope for Navi? Uh, 
Well, I, yeah, I don't think they screwed up the launch. It wasn't a smooth launch. They certainly could have done better. And yeah, I mean, they would have been a lot better off delaying the card by a week or two to get the press driver sorted out. The press driver was an absolute... I can't use that language. It was a mess. <laughs> it, it, it was an absolute mess. And it was bad in all games. The second I started testing, I ran into troubles. I reached out to Steve from Gamers Nexus and he said, I haven't started testing yet. I'll let you know if I run into any problems. He said, I'll be testing in about an hour. About an hour later, he gets back to me. This is a nightmare. So I don't know what kind of level of testing they did to validate that driver ready for press, but it's kind of a big deal that you get press a working, stable, reliable driver that performs as it should. So, yeah, I mean, that's where they screwed up. That it would have been Our review would have been good if we didn't have to include all that nonsense, but thankfully the public driver was perfectly fine, so I suppose that's uh, equally important, if not more so. Uh, then the things like the noise, that's annoying. I would have rather, yeah, they made the card run five degrees hotter and be a bit quieter. That probably would have been a better balance there. So the fan curve could have definitely done with some basic tweaking. So I agree with you there. That's something that I think all of us will agree on. Uh, as for the power consumption, I'm not sure there's too much they can do there. Again, we talked about uh, those problems in a previous comment, uh, earlier question. Um... Yeah, and then the UEFI stuff, that was a, an unfortunate oversight. Um, but yeah, I think, I think to say why, you know, is AMD unable to launch things like this properly is a little bit unfair. Um, considering the juggernauts that they're up against, I think for the most part they do do a pretty good job. They make some odd choices at times, but, you know, who knows how these companies think. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think overall it was a total screw up. I think the Radeon 7 is okay it just fails to really excite at the, at the yeah. current price so i think that's pretty much end of it another question from our discord chat here so i've just been watching the big benchmark video for the 1660 ti in the graph versus the 1070 we can see the 1660 ti falling behind the 1070 in roughly 50 percent of the games do you have any theories about why this is the case is it the six gigabyte frame buffer already showing its limitations oh okay uh, no, definitely not that. Uh, I talked about that. Oh, I alluded to it. Probably didn't get into it that clearly. But the main reason is there's a big difference in CUDA core uh, count there. So if they both had the same amount of CUDA cores, so if they both had 1,920 CUDA cores, they would both deliver, well, worst case, the Turing GPU would be this would deliver the same level of performance. That would be worst case. But best case, it would be much faster. So... I think it's 1,536. That sounds about right. Yep, CUDA cores for the GTX 1660 Ti. So, you know, it's got quite, there is quite a difference there in CUDA core counts. So the fact that it overall delivers the same performance is, yeah, speaks to the improvements they've made with the Turing architecture. All right, next question here. I think this one's a bit of a news corner guy question, but I'll just sort of read between the lines on this one. Uh, Intel's now starting to promote their new or their upcoming first ever discrete graphics card. Actually, it's not the first ever. I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, they're starting to promote their new one, their new graphics card. Uh, when do you guys think or your sources say, <laughs> sources, that's funny. Uh, when would it be a reasonable launch window uh, f for this new product? When, when will the cards be targeting market arrival? I, I, yeah. No idea. No idea on that one. I assume this was a heavily outvoted comment, which is why. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, Seems like 2020 still. Yeah. We don't really have... Saying what tier, who knows. Yeah. I mean, it's way too early for any of this stuff to be uh, discussed in any detail. We just don't know. Yeah. I mean, we would definitely expect Intel to be promoting their stuff from well out because, mm -hmm. you know, this is a new segment for them, so they need to get people to be aware that they're actually doing this, mm -hmm. aware so that when they eventually launch them, people aren't just like, oh, wow, look at that. You know, that people can be hyped about it, but... Certainly, I wouldn't be expecting it anytime soon. Yeah, so we don't speak to Intel too much directly. There's not really much representation for them in Australia where they talk to the media. Uh, and then board partners haven't said a thing. So, yep, not, nothing to go on there. All right. Cheesy Game from YouTube is asking us all the most important questions here. Oh, a hard run shoot. Boxed. Um, how many times did X give it to you while playing Resident Evil 2? <laughs> I didn't play enough of Resident <laughs> didn't Evil play it. I played it. In, oh, yeah. Yeah, he gave it to me a few times, that's for sure. 
All right, another quick question here. Is it better to have 16 gigabytes of memory in single channel or eight gigabytes in dual channel? Uh, for gaming, especially if you've got Ryzen, well, that's true of Intel, I would rather have eight gigabytes in dual channel rather than 16 gigabytes in single channel. 16 gigabyte single channel would be a pretty weird, unusual configuration. You'd have to have... Mm. It's more well, common than you think on laptops though. Oh, that's true. Desktops. That's true. Yeah. You now there's big, big performance boosts from dual channel. There wasn't once upon a time, but there really is now. Um, so I would rather have less memory, but have it in dual channel with more bandwidth. Okay, with more developers embracing DirectX 12. <laughs> oh, DirectX 12. Uh, well, yeah, we'll get to that in a moment. Do you think we're going to see a return of dual GPU cards in the next two years? Uh, definitely not. No, they're dead. No, no dual they're... GPU cards are dead. SLI's is dead. Crossfire's dead. They're all people get a few people get really upset when I say that. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, it's... The, the issue with DirectX 12 is that it's actually harder to implement. to implement dual GPU support. With sure, it's on the developers; they can do whatever they want with the dual GPUs. They can do all sorts of crazy techniques, but it's it's less straightforward because mm. with with DirectX 11, it was just you just use the standard what was it called multi-frame rendering technique or whatever was used for yeah yep, yep. um direct x11 and basically that was a driver level feature you could just enable it yeah some games it obviously didn't work but it was a lot simpler to enable that feature for direct x11 whereas direct x12 putting on the developers uh they have to do their own coding it, the lack of dual gpu mm -hmm. rigs it's just yeah it's just not going to happen it was very promising and looked great with ashes of the singularity uh, they did some phenomenal work there with even being able to use GeForce and Radeon GPUs and combining them. It was really cool, but yeah, though, those guys did some impressive work with the game engine that we didn't see extend to other games. All right, final question. And we didn't actually mention it in these Q&As, but we're going through another another heat wave in Melbourne. What is yeah. going on? Every time we do a Q&A, there's another heat yeah. wave. So It was like low 20s yesterday, and it's yeah. now the, the mid-30s. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Getting into the high 30s. And, and that's yeah. Celsius. And there's no yeah. air con in here, so yeah, I'm starting to stick to the desk. So thankfully, we're on the last question. Um, but yeah, we've been going through a lot of water in between questions. And this is another really important question that we've definitely never answered before in the Q&A series. What car do you drive daily? It's really weird that you guys ask us what cars we drive because we're YouTubers. So yeah, it's obvious, isn't it? Yeah, I've got a Lamborghini. Yeah. So Tim's only been doing YouTube for a year now. So a year's not enough to get a Lamborghini, but he's got a high-end Audi. Mm -hmm. And then two years is, is the Lamborghini. Is yeah, it? I'm thinking yeah. of a Lamborghini for the track yep. and then making the Audi just my daily driver. Sort yeah, of thing. I think that's a sensible way of going about the car thing. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I've been using mine on the road. It's um, not very fuel efficient and yeah, racking up the miles on my Lambo. Uh, but seriously, I drive a very exciting diesel Passat. So yeah, I and I have a Mazda 6, so it's not much more so, exciting, is it? So that's what we drive. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching. All right, and that's it for the February Q&A series, two parts. Make sure you've watched all of them because both of them are pretty good, I reckon. Lots of fantastic questions that you guys asked us, both our Discord, which, by the way, you can get access to our Discord if you sign up to our Patreon, so that's a nice little perk there, but yep. also on the YouTube community tab as well. Some good stuff there. And on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. So I guess that's it. We'll be back for another Q&A next month. Until then, I guess we'll see you next time. Who are you? I'm Tim, again. <laughs> Probably the fourth time I've mentioned this in the in the Q and A series so far. And I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time. <laughs>